Hello and welcome to another Chrono Walker or wait, no, not another. Welcome to the first Chrono Walker interview with a non-Chrono Walker champion. So we're very happy to welcome Palmer, the first place finisher at the recent Compete Esports Circuit Qualifier for Nationals. Uh, he took Anubia Bolt Walker, shall we say, deck to uh, a very impressive first place finish. You might almost say the most impressive finish. For those who don't know, these uh, circuit qualifiers, the top eight players in each qualifier get invited to Nationals, also known as the Days of Beckoning, which was recently announced to be on November 19th to 20th at the Waves Gaming Arena in Toronto, Canada. Uh, yeah, and so we have Palmer with us who um, did beat me in the uh, in the top eight. So How rude. Congrats, I know, right? It was very rude. But I would like to add that I believe George would like it to be known that Palmer is actually the US national champion uh, <laughs> because the Compete Sport Tournament is the uh, US championships. So um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's basically it. But anyway, we have uh, Palmer uh, here with, uh, with the first place in that tournament so I welcome aboard i thought you're going to interject there eric by saying that you actually beat palmer in the swiss in round four to like save a little bit of your ego there i thought that was the interjection you were going to mention <laughs> oh I, I don't i don't have any ego sorry nice yes <laughs> but palmer welcome welcome uh thanks for having me so i guess to start off tell us a little bit about us so like how did you get into genesis so around four months ago Genesis picked up in popularity around my LGS, which is Compete Sports. Me and a couple other people started like building decks and such. Played it for a couple months and then playing the US National Championships. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, what made Genesis like stand out to you? Like you, you see a game popping up at, at your game store, but what made you be like, oh, hey, this is actually kind of fun. What, what did you like? I uh, thought it was pretty unique. And interesting that it uses a grid. So in this one, you actually kind of have like pieces that you position, interactions like that. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, no, that's definitely the part yeah. I think that it's in common with a lot of people. People falling yeah. in love with the little, I don't know, whether it's like Fire Emblem-esque, that gets a lot, a lot of people in miniature gamings, but with a deck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then, yeah, shout out to Duelist as well, or something like that. Mm. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I agree. That was the same thing that, that got me into the game as well, the uh, tactical aspect of it. What's your experience with TCGs in general, Palmer? So I've been playing Magic for about six years. Play that a lot, still do. Flesh and Blood was a thing for a little bit, about four months before Genesis. Okay. Minus this deck, uh, were there any champions that you like immediately latched onto as you were like, uh, learning about Genesis? Initially, when I was trying to find my first champion, I was like looking through him. I was just looking for the who had the most amount of aura that can just like jam spells throughout the entire game. And I found Nubio with 150 aura and also had at the beginning of round draw card. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> that was exactly me too. Like I, I was like, wait, <laughs> per, wait, I am the source of the card draw. I can become card draw itself. And I was like, yeah, exactly. Nubia, bam. My first deck was Nubia, just like drawing cards and getting to play more things. And first uh, deck, Nubia, Nubia, Searing Light, Vorpal Blade combo, terrible <laughs> deck. Don't play it. But uh... <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> We're having a bit too much fun. Let's get focused back in. No fun allowed. No Let's fun go. allowed. Yeah, this is a deck building. <laughs> and then tournament report uh, stream. But yeah, so the Nubia Bolt Walker deck. So how did this deck start? What, is there a key interaction you wanted to work through? How, yeah, how did this deck start? Initially when I was getting into it, looked at Nubia, thought that was cool, and just started building like a burn deck with it. So I think I had some like seven bolt shots, four epiphanies, uh, the Vorpal Blades, of course, to go with the Searing Lights. 12, 14 Kabus. It was pretty wild. <laughs> Origins came out, looked at Tsunami, and I was like, oh, this card's kind of just good. Like, took some Vorpal Blades out for the Tsunami, forgot to ever touch the Searing Light with Rotang that was out for a uh, Wind Slash. Took out some Epiphanies, added in more Bolt Shots, and that's basically how the deck ended up. Okay, when yes. When did you realize oh. that uh, Chrono Walker was a busted card as well? I was actually playing against Wallendal a lot, and so... He had initially built a Rain OTK deck. Turn one, he just like Epiphany, Epiphany, uh, teleport right next to you, throw a bunch of damage at you, kill you. And I was like, I kind of need a way around this. 
So I looked at Chrono Walker, and I found that to be a very interesting interaction where I can just put myself on top of him and basically negate his entire turn. On my turn with Nubia, just kind of sidestep, rotate, and then maybe kill him. Okay, and then you kind of lash on because, like, if we're if we're looking at the deck here, uh, Chrono Walker is your only movement tech. You have one fifth of your deck being movement, but your only way to move at swift speed to react to your enemy's plays is with Chrono Walker. Yeah, the the benefit to that is if whatever I'm moving with leaves behind a body, like yeah. even if it survives with one life, it's still going to be somebody that has a swift attack for three down the line you know mm -hmm. yeah absolutely what is the main game plan like when you're when you're sitting down i'll kind of just start the game by advancing one space just like because i'm just gonna let myself draw a couple more cards and my opponent like maybe get up to a critical mass of like full shot plus steering light but then also in turn one i like to like drop a kabuz might burn a chrono walker if like, if I have three Chrono Walkers, I'll drop a Chrono Walker on turn one. That way, on that next round, I'll have something to use before Nubia so that I can see what my opponent is kind of thinking about doing before I actually get to use Nubia. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, using the turn economy to kind of force your opponent to act, and then you can react to them profitably. And I also know with first-hand experience that you, you, know, you can't play passively against Nubia. Or else, you know, you'll drop down five Chrono Walkers and five Bolt Shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, like the longer the yeah. game goes, you, the more that card advantage is going more and more powerful. And like we're kind of on the, I guess, the philosophy of Burn, right? I'm going to convert my cards in hand into damage directly and murder you. So yeah, just to kind of latch onto that critical mass idea, like is there like a minimum amount of damage uh, you want to have in hand before you start really getting aggressive? So typically I'll think about actually moving up to my opponent to like two spots in front of them awareness that like steering light has around when i'm like anywhere from like four to two damage short start moving in with like my summons try and get some more chip damage on them and hopefully between the summons dealing the damage to them and then also with the card draw off nubia i might draw into one of my 12 bolt shots and there's the four damage that i need right there or maybe Chrono Walker, you get like closer to them. Basically, any number of cards in my deck aren't bad there, unless I draw like a Mind Ring or a Kabu's. Were there any cards, I guess, before we wrap up the, the deck building section, uh, that you, you tried out for this deck, but then you ended up moving away from them? Like, obviously, Wind Slash, you said you would have put in if you had it. But yeah, are there any cards you tried out and then just they just weren't working out and you pulled them away? Ah, oh, yeah. So, uh, I think it was about three in the morning of the event, still had yet to go to sleep. Cut an amount of Psychic Blast for Bolt Shots, Chrono Walkers, Tsunamis. I did that because having two cards in your deck that include discarding a card, it's just negative tempo. No, it's interesting there because, yeah, Psychic Blast, which people have been seeing on screen, is like first 6G4 damage Swift Speed attack in the game. But yeah, like you mentioned, cost is that discard. And the traditional DBA decks, which are less all in on this like philosophy of I'm converting all my cards into damage, might yeah be able to play that a bit better because you do have cards which are more conditional and easier to, to discard. But every card in your deck, minus like a second copy of Mind Reading or even the first if you're just going for the kill, is dealing damage, right? Kabuses, Chrono Walkers, and then Tsunami, Searing Light, and Bolt Shot. So 94% of your deck is damage one way shape or form but that being said we did talk about that after our first game right our first match about possibly doing a nubia psychic blast deck that went down from your bolt shots to be more of like a straight up burn deck uh which you know something that we we kind of brainstormed but uh we'd have to see i do agree in your take and taking them out in this specific deck because of like what you said the, the capus <laughs> is hitting your hand as well and you have the space for the bolt shots so you know why not yeah, like, I yep. mean, speaking of space for the bolt shot, we, we got the 249 uh, Chi deck here uh, taking first place, which is interesting because, uh, like, maybe people say, oh, you've left value on the table. But actually, Eric and I were discussing before how over the course of a normal game, say, like, say five turns is, is a normal game. It's, uh, you see 15 cards uh, with Nubia, right? And that's 
30% of your deck, so you've only seen 0.3 chi less in those 15 cards, right? So there's definitely a concept here which I hadn't thought about, where when a deck is as honed as this, and where, well, it's, you know, got bigger with Origins, the card pool of Genesis isn't such that where you can just, like, have a card that does the same thing at a higher chi and does it better. Like, the there isn't just, like, better bolt shot at 8 chi uh, that does 5 damage and you just go up 1 chi, right? So, while the card pool is small like this, there's definitely an argument where having 249 chi but the perfect arrangement of cards is probably better than having 250 chi and then your your cards are like a little bit more different because you got one one card different um, yeah i will say i would like to see down one searing light up one tsunami just so that we, we can actually call a deck bolt walkers because i think now we have to call it searing shot right we, we can't really use oh. walk from the name. <laughs> <laughs> certainly something to think about cool were there cards that you didn't expect to play but ended up making the deck. You didn't think it'd be good enough, but then it started just, you needed it, so it came in. Uh, actually, mind reading, I was like initially thinking, well, I don't think I really need mind reading because I'm planning on closing out the game a lot faster. But then I kind of realized mind reading also has an effect of like your opponent doesn't want to go up next to you. They're less likely to come up to me and directly attack me or something like that. <laughs> when i have mind ring on the field that's definitely a factor i know in one of our games that we played on stream in fact where i had an amazing hand but i didn't know if i wanted to you know run up and show off my hand so i did I definitely consider that for a while that being said i did end up running up to you and showing you my hand because it was just too good right so <laughs> what are you gonna do about yeah. it you know um but yeah I can, I can definitely see that being a factor where somebody will not want to run up and show their hand even though it's probably the best move there's also the mental pressure of like if you wait longer then maybe it gets another card up so that there's a little bit of i guess decision paralysis you can give your opponent there yeah i definitely know that there are some analysis paralysis that i had when we both had our mind readings out and so I'm looking at your hand, I'm looking at my hand, I'm oh, trying gosh. to track all the things. Like, <laughs> if, you, if you do this, I do that. And then and then my mind would like break down and I would stop being able to think through it and then forget what I was doing and have to redo it all over again. Um, I kind of went through the same thing with my reading, so I can definitely... <laughs> I, I, I like that idea, just as a uh, kind of almost defensive card. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the line there, Eric, is that when you know, you know your opponent's playing mind reading is you remove your mind readings so that you don't need to worry about that. Uh, so then you remove the mental load, and then and then it's it's so much easier mm. to play. Is uh... oh, I see. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have the information, it can't hurt you. Uh, though I will mention there is the trap of, of of what Eric just mentioned as well, where if if someone's hand is too good, maybe they want to run up to you and show your their hand to you with mind reading, because like legally within the game, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I don't. I don't judge. Uh, can you can you reveal your hand at any time? You can reveal your hand at any time. Yes, there's no real. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to wear a suit of armor or just a mirror on your chest and play all your games like that, there's you are allowed to do it. So a new challenge: you give my opponent a mind reading every every game. Yeah, yeah. Just play open. So it was like, hey, you don't need to play mind reading. I'll save you some chi. That's... Some some aura. Cool. <laughs> All right, uh, that I think we've, we've hit most of the death building stuff. So uh, let's get into like, yeah, more into playing. Uh, so you're on the philosophy of burning people out. What decks uh, are you most worried about with this deck? Uh, I'd say I'm pretty scared of Ton because he just charges head first into you and I don't get to develop my full advantage with card draw there. Right. No, Ton just doesn't care. He's going to barrel head first into you and just trying to end you immediately. So I just got to hope to draw more, like, bolt shots and maybe, like, Kabus to, I guess, deal some more damage. But then he just flies right over him, and it doesn't really matter in the end anyway. Right. So, um, there weren't that many cons in this tournament. Would do you think that that kind of attributed to your success? Like, there's zero in the top eight, which is the first time in a long time. Probably, to be honest. Like, having not as many cons around definitely felt nice. If I'm not mistaken, the person that beat you on Con, that was his only win in the tournament. So yeah, uh, so just that that kind of can show how bad the matchup can be, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I guess Bolt Shot being like a key part of uh, your damage here, we got 12 copies. How how many copies do you usually find yourself playing? 
I think I usually play like five to six bolt shots in a game, something like that. And yeah, my deck does get pretty low and near the end of the game, I'm kind of just looking at, all right, each of these bolt shots take four more cards out of my deck. Nubia is taking two every turn. I just gotta think like if my deck is actually big enough to really win in the end of the game. A couple times in practice, I'd like actually have to count the amount of cards in my deck just to see if I physically could play enough bolt shots. Uh, that also happened against Eric in our round one of the top eight, where can I even cast all these bolt shots that are in my hand right now? Yeah, and I think you, you could, right? It, but it was close, if I recall. Yeah, I think I was like six cards away from not being able to cast all of them. Mm -hmm. At that point, I didn't have very many turns to actually like do stuff. Right. What about aura? Corona Walker is not a cheap card, even even for Nubia. It's more than 10% of your aura every time you use it. Uh, do you find yourself running low on aura? Is that ever part of the calculus? Uh, I don't usually find myself running a lot on aura because realistically the only things in my deck that are costing me aura is the Corona Walker, the Searing Light, and the Tsunami. One mind ring if I play it. Between those, I don't really run low on aura most games because I'm not actively playing many Chrono Walkers until like my opponent tries to deal a lot of damage to me. At one point I was about to take 12 damage from a stack of like a couple bolt shots and a Tsunami or something like that. And I just Chrono Walkered away from him. Did the opponent keep building this stack, or how, how did a stack like that develop? He had the foresight fourth of the Ancients, if I'm not mistaken. Is that the why? Is oh, that why yeah, he just. Built? Oh, yeah, then he, right. he just slammed foresight of the Ancients, drew like seven cards or something, and just killed me after that. The opponent's on foresight of the Ancients, that makes perfect sense that they were trying to build up a large stack, um, which is why. Uh, you mm -hmm. were able to use a Chrono Walker so effectively to dodge 12 damage there. Although, yeah. unfortunately, they drew a lot of cards in it and, and killed you. But, I mean, I mean, you, you take what you can you can't get. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I, I will say I did notice, uh, like, you didn't really run out of aura right in any of our games. Because, yeah, as you are saying, like, you might play, like, one Tsunami in a game, maybe a couple of Searing Lights, maybe a Mind Reading, and then the rest of our Chrono Walkers. So like you could probably play like six, seven Chrono Walkers at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, all your other cards are bolt shots in Kappa. So you actually weren't really that taxed on your aura. And so there are a lot of games where like, oh, maybe he can run out of aura. And then I look and you still have like a hundred aura and like four Chrono Walkers and a Sadami in your hand. And I'm like, okay, maybe maybe uh, he can't run out of aura. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, really interesting actually, because like the, the amazing deck tools analysis that Fate Weaver has, shout out to Awesome Asim. The energy uh, turns is 10 plus. And the aura turns is seven but because of the style of some of the aura cards are playing like specifically like chrono walker it being a reactive play keep in mind these awesome death statistics but don't let it be a hundred percent of your guiding light because uh how you play these cards which cost aura is also going to affect the aura turns of your deck and yep. yeah this deck while it seems it runs out of aura first actually energy maybe is a bigger consideration mm -hmm. Yeah, because like Tsunami and Chrono Walker aren't going to be cards that you play as soon as you draw them. Absolutely. And the aura turns is, is only really accurate if you play every card you draw. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess uh, with that, I think let's move over to the four thoughts. See here, we've got pretty owned in as well. Like your main deck is six different cards. Your your four thoughts are four different cards and one of them was already in your main deck. So we've got a fourth copy of Mind Reading, uh, four flights, four Olims, and a Guardians of Balance. I guess let's start with the easy one, Mind Reading. Uh yeah, I'd mainly bring them in against, like, Huns for a lot. Take out a Kabu's. Did you bring uh, them in against me? I'm yeah, that was what I was going to ask. Yeah, did you bring in against Eric? It, yeah, I'll, I'll bring them in against any opponent that tries to get up in my face. Like, if I can deter them from getting up in my face and get a couple more cards off, the more the better. I will say that Eric had the advantage of being with the only one who knew going into the tournament how his deck worked. Because I don't think uh, the Worm Strike is really being uh, some off stuff anyone else has put together yet, at least at the major tournaments. Like, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sure we're not the first people to look at Bosin and say, oh, look, Emerging Worm is really cool with Bosin. <laughs> but and I'm pretty uh, sure we were. I'm pretty sure literally uh, no one else besides oh. us has ever thought of that before. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, no, you may be right. Yes. Yeah, we are very smart yeah. here. Double plus smart. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, and one thing you also brought in was the flight. How often did you bring that in? Did you like it? So normally I'll bring the flight in anytime I'm bringing in like all copies of my looms. I don't want to get movement restricted as much because if I play in a loom on both sides of me, I can only move front and back. 
And then in matches with Bazin, he'd box me in, like, in round one. He just boxed me in, and I was like, ah, this kind of just sucks. Play kind of just allows me to not get boxed in like that. Are they always a pair, then? They always come in together? Most games, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and what are you pulling out, I guess, for those flights and alums? I'm actually just going, like, 4-4-4 four, four, four and 5-5 five, and five, and taking out, like, all the tsunamis and all the steering lights for those looms and flights, like, four of each. Okay, that is actually super interesting because... Because uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of like gameplay overlap, right? Tsunami helps you clear out glutted board states, but you're, you're saying that oh. uh, like the flight and the, you'll bring out tsunamis when the alums are coming in? Yeah, so the reason why I also don't like tsunami and loom in the same deck as much is because loom is also just a three health thing. Yeah. Like you'll just end up killing an loom. And then also, as we were talking about earlier with Aura, the loom costs 12, tsunami costs 18. I'm going to cut back on my aura with the illumes, but also go up a little bit when I'm going fight for searing light. Right. Interesting. That makes sense. I was also just going to point out that flight is a quick enchant, which is something we both learned that day. (laughs) Quick tip. Yeah, so like... You can play it at the end of somebody's turn and then move away. Yeah, say after someone has boxed you in with a bunch of emergent rooms, you could uh, (laughs) put it on right there. It's really interesting what you're saying there, problem with the Tsunami's Alums is like, it sounds like you're putting a lot of incentive on not having any anti-synergy at all. Like, you don't want to play Tsunamis with Alum, and you just don't want to hit your own things. Is that like, is that maybe part of like the speed of how you play? Like, once you've got to the critical mass, you want to end the game very, very quickly. So then having no cards which anti-synergize at all feels important to you? Uh, honestly, I think it comes from playing Magic and like, just not wanting my deck to not work with itself like that. I look at my cards in my deck and a card that I think I really want in my deck, and I'm like, well, it also just shuts down this card. So I tend to try and stay away from that. Uh, look, I will say that, you know, Genesis, while it is being around for a, d- a little bit of time now, I do feel that we're still all kind of learning how the game plays. Uh, like the finite resources for me really just kind of recontextualizes a lot of stuff. Never mind the complexity of having a two dimensional space to move around your cards in and how, for example, for people who have come from magic, like there really isn't an analog to a movement technique, right? We can understand the decoy part of changing the targeting on Chrono Walker, but the switch, whether there's that does doesn't fit with anything, right? How quickly did you take out Guardian Balance after the tournament? Uh, the next day. Uh, and what, sorry, what was it for, actually? So this was something that at about 3 in the morning, I was thinking, hmm, Guardian Balance might be nice against any aggro matchup. And so we put it in and just didn't actually really think about it and then proceeded to regret it the next day, well, later that day, I guess. When I did bring it in in exactly one game and just did not like it. What didn't it do? Like what what made it into, oh, this doesn't fit with what I thought it was going to do? It doesn't have a swift attack, so I can't really use it in the same way that I can use a Chrono Walker where I move up to you and then hit you. Mm. I kind of just got to edge up to you with Guardian of Balance and then hit you for five if I get that far. Yeah. I was also thinking that the like Day of Peace trigger would be nice against those Zagger matchups, but I guess it really didn't like click in my mind that they're just going to probably unload bolt shots upon me when I attempt to Guardian Balance trigger, and then maybe just kill me and the Guardian Balance in response, something like that. Right, exactly. because I guess you're in the mix of things uh, generally. The Guardian Balance, it might be more likely to be in a position where it's going to get killed immediately, which will fizzle the trigger, right? So yeah, I guess uh, any thoughts uh, over the tournament of your of your Swift Swiss rounds? I guess. Uh, I remember in match two, I played against a pretty spicy Idris deck where they'd attempt to like landslide me and then unload barracks and just kill me on the spot, and that caught me by surprising our first game. And then I just used Chrono Walkers to escape the landslides whenever I could. Okay. That was really interesting for match two. Yeah, playing against the Bazin Worm Strike in match four, that was really cool to just see in action. Like, I never thought about 
Bazin just slamming worms on the field and then just dealing you three. You heard it here first, folks. The Chrono Walkers had an original <laughs> idea. Is all us. We're the smartest. Everyone be very proud of us. <laughs> that certainly caught me by surprise in match four. Hmm? And I really didn't know how to fight it in match four, if I'm being honest, so... I mean, maybe that's a good lead in into the second match against the Worm Strike. So, how did the the first match inform your your second match? Did you play different, sideboard different for that first uh, round of the top eight? You played uh, Cabus on the right instead of the left. Yes, yes, I played Cabus on the right side of my Nubia instead of the left side. That is one thing that I definitely did, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think that definitely contributed towards that game. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, deciding, deciding factor right there. <laughs> but I also did, I hung more back. Like, I didn't play as aggressively into him because I think around then I realized that he was just going to run up to me anyway. Mm. So by me closing that gap, like I usually do, just worked against me in this matchup. Right. Yeah, I would say that in our second match, you definitely played a lot better. Um, and you, you learned kind of a little bit more of the deck and the spacing and you know, kind of biding your time a little bit more because you do get that longer game advantage. Eric's one weakness, uh, uh, an opponent who learns. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, did you end up sideboarding differently? Um, or was it the same? I don't Four think thought. I sideboarded much different. Actually, no, I did sideboard different. I think I only took in two looms this time, and I left the three tsunamis in as a counterplay against the worm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Makes sense. Eric will like to, to dump those on you. Or your tournament didn't end in the first round of, of, of top eight. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> subtle dig. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess you want to talk about the, those, the semifinals and finals? I played against that same Idris deck from the second match. And so I knew generally what his plan was there. The Brooks. Yep. Yeah. So I was able to play better in that one than the first one then in the final round i played against walenda with tashir and that was just a very interesting game where it's like we both kind of wanted that spacing of two across from each other okay like uh just to latch on to that do you usually find yourself using the like the second space of bolt shot more than the first space but in, in that match in particular you because of obviously tashir's awesome awareness uh, you find yourself moving in closer? Is that kind of how that worked out? Yeah, whenever I moved into like one space in front of them, that was either for mind reading to see their hand, like I did against Walenda, or it was to get the swift attack for one off Nubia, which basically never exists. Yeah, so I'm glad we hit that in the last leg of the interview. You do give up the basic attack of Nubia. You ignore it just to have that spacing, remove a little bit more of counterplay from your opponent, and use a second space of bolt shot. Well... I think I think it's actually because he has that full art foil Nubia. <laughs> he forgot that bolt oh, that yeah. he has, that has a basic attack. Nubia yes, just there is that full art foil Nubia that I have. Yeah. So I, I'm very uh, yeah. jealous. I, I know there are definitely times when you, you missed out on the basic attack and I mean I, I did sometimes as well, so I understand, but yeah, without that reminder attack, it's like, oh yeah, she she can attack. Oops. Her swift attack for one is just so far in the back of my mind that I don't always remember it. It's just like Nubia is there for card draw and 150 or. Yeah, pay to lose. That's what it is for most <laughs> games. I guess for our final thought, any changes you would make to this deck going forward? You talked about the wind slash, so it does have a energy component that might be something to pay attention to. As you mentioned, energy is a bigger concern for this deck on average. Yeah, so the Guardians definitely come out. Up one Illume to match number of Tsunamis, which is something that I actually forgot to do before the event. Drop a Bolt Shot for Epiphany. It gives me a little bit more velocity at the cost of like a Bolt Shot, but with drawing three cards, I'm likely to draw into a Bolt Shot anyway. Right. And if I don't, then I also have equally as good with Chrono Walker. Dropping the steering lights for wind slashes, that's something. Gonna need more like deck testing on that. From what I've played with it, it there is a distinct difference between wind slash being a swift yeah. and <laughs> steering light being an action. So it actually does allow me to play faster and actually use the full two spaces of movement that I can get and then unload. But there's that two energy as well. So do you find yourself running out of energy 
Yeah, that's the part where I need to do more testing on yeah. is because I haven't really played enough with it to figure out if the two energy is going to be a consistent problem because I think I've only played about five games using the wind slashes, but from what I've seen, they're pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Sweet. They're pretty um, nice. I think I did duck myself once or twice at least, though. Yeah, but... yeah I know we had a game where you did. Yes. I mean, uh, sometimes that's part of it, right? Like, you kind of have to, to go for it. This deck very much is, rather than like what we've seen with dedicated its studies, even in Nubia decks, to make your hand craft even better. This is a really interesting, I think, going to the other side of every card has a purpose and a focus. Very few cards are bad in duplicates. And then just using the raw card advantage of Nubia to accelerate the deck. Mm. Any final comments you'd like to say to anyone thinking of picking up the deck? Yeah, definitely just ignore the Guardian balances they are just bad <laughs> <laughs> cool so with that we'll say i guess like thank you palmer so much for coming to join us today to talk about your first place deck uh hopefully yeah. we'll meet up at nationals we'll see how things go thanks for kicking me out of the tournament <laughs> i appreciate it <laughs> yeah yeah eric got to yeah, have a more relaxed evening thanks to not having to play any more genesis so he's very appreciative mm -hmm. and yeah we'll go with that uh, shout out to Screaming Skeleton, where you can see actually Wormstrike versus Boltwalker. Uh, we'll put a link for people to, be able yep. to see that. And, and for somebody that is listening, it's at 3 hours, 57 minutes, 12 seconds, if they want to check out the timestamp. But we will link it in the uh, description. Yeah. And as always, like, comment, and subscribe uh, so we can keep on bringing you more content. Or just tell us what content you want and we'll do it, because we're that <laughs> lonely. Um, we're not lonely. Uh, Shut up, you're lonely. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah. yeah thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for having me. Bye.